The past 18 months or so have not been friendly for many indoor ag companies. But once you look beyond the boom and bust headlines, the story starts to look a little more interesting for the future of the category. We don't think it's the be all end all. We think it has a, a role to play. There's always gonna be field grown product. There's always gonna be greenhouse product. I think now you're gonna see vertical farm product or you are seeing it. And it's really the, you know, the integration of those three silos is gonna be really interesting in the next few years. Jeff McKinnon is the Senior Vice President for Truly Sustainable Agriculture. He's a finance guy who's excited about the economics of vertical farming, even though so many have struggled or shut down this past year. I think some of it was poor design. Some of it was too much tech focus and iterating. And then the coffers ran dry. Those coffers he's referring to are investment dollars. Jeff is also an active venture investor who has an interesting perspective on the current state of fundraising. There's a tremendous amount of capital out there, but it's a little more astute, it's a little more risk averse, and it's a little more discerning in terms of where they're gonna place their bets. So I think, I wouldn't say there's less money out there, but there's a lot more sitting on the sidelines. Where does indoor ag go next on today's Future of Agriculture podcast? Well, hello, fellow ag nerd. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Future of Agriculture. My name is Tim Hamrich, and every week you and I get to hear from the founders, farmers, innovators and investors, the people shaping the future of the ag industry. Another great episode for you here today. Really interesting insights. But before we get into that, I want to take just a moment to thank our quarterly presenting sponsor, which is Calgary Economic Development. What makes Calgary, Alberta, the engine of Canada's agriculture industry? With direct access to a strong agricultural base, Calgary is a well-connected region with collaboration across geographic areas, industries, and research and training institutions. Calgary has experts in all things ag, including primary production, crop science, protein development, ag and food tech innovation, and animal health. It's also a hub for controlled environment agriculture, which we're going to talk about here today, energy transition opportunities, and value-added food and beverage processing. Calgary is a hotspot for agri-food production and technology development, which is why multinational agribusiness leaders call the city home. In Calgary, they're leading the agribusiness revolution, and you are welcome to join. Visit calgaryagbusiness.com to learn more. That's calgaryagbusiness.com. Thank you very much to Calgary for supporting the Future of Agriculture podcast. All right, now back to today's episode, which is with Jeff McKinnon of True Leaf Sustainable Agriculture. Jeff and I have a really frank conversation about the current state of controlled environment agriculture. He really speaks candidly and holds nothing back in talking about the industry's struggles, but also why he is still more bullish than ever about what they're trying to do to provide local, fresh, indoor grown produce. He also has some really interesting ideas about some new products that might be on the horizon that are uniquely suited for these growing systems and really some great insights into the current state of fundraising and venture capital in general. So background here on Jeff, he's been working in senior financial leadership roles over the past 18 years within a variety of sectors, including financial services, real estate, retail, and food and beverage. Jeff has always been active in the startup to growth phase food and ag tech ecosystem in Canada, but more recently has developed a passion for assisting these companies to capitalize and execute growth strategies. He's currently the senior VP of Truly Sustainable Agriculture, a Canadian-based company that uses technology to displace field-grown produce. In 2018, the company partnered with McCain Food Limited to develop and execute an international expansion strategy. During Jeff's tenure at Trulief, he has served as CFO and Senior VP, leading the company through a number of significant financing rounds, both debt and equity, and has led corporate development and government relations. Under Jeff's leadership, the company has completed farm builds in Nova Scotia, Ontario, and has two significant projects underway in Quebec and in Calgary, Alberta. 
Jeff is also a general partner in a carbon tech venture fund. So without further ado, here's a really interesting conversation with Jeff McKinnon of True Leaf Sustainable Agriculture. He's going to talk about the very first pilot facility that they worked on, which was an old building that used to be a school in Nova Scotia. Jeff said they had a lot of failures and a lot of learnings that they have used over the years to develop into the system that they are now expanding across Canada today. Here's Jeff McKinnon of True Leaf Sustainable Agriculture. To the credit of the founder and the team, from day one, we said, we're not a technology company, we're a food company. So at the end of the day, you can do whatever you want with technology, IPs, patents, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if the product coming out the other end doesn't taste good or people don't want to buy it, you really don't have anything. So we focused early on food and quality and taste. So we go into this old school, keeping in mind, you've got a couple agronomists, scientists, You've got a couple sales guys, which was the founder's background, and then finance guy. We didn't know anything about food production or even manufacturing or processing for that matter. So we just figured, oh, if we grow the food, it'll just all work itself out. But we didn't consider, you know, what the implications are for food safety. We didn't consider process flow. We didn't consider that when you take a bench scale product that tastes really good and you put it in an old gym and you're, you know, 30 feet in the air. You've got air stratification, you've got all kinds of engineering considerations that never even crossed our mind. So we got in there and the yields weren't great. The product was wet. Operationally was really challenging because of the food safety considerations. We had to constantly be cleaning areas because we were sort of there's risk of cross contamination and and it was an old school. So then the floor starts to crack. You know, probably the most interesting story, or at least from my perspective. We built this thing in an old school. So it's cinder block. You think of an old gym. It's a big cinder block room. It's all kind of exterior walls. And we thought, great. In Nova Scotia, it's cold in the winter and it's, you know, mildly warm in the summer. We thought, okay, well, the summer is going to be challenging because we're going to have heat. And vertical farming LED lights, they inherently create heat. So one of the challenges is removing heat from the process and humidity. So we said, okay, well, you know, Nova Scotia, you've got July and August, it's hot. The rest of the year, it's pretty mild, I suppose. Um, What we didn't consider was you've got, you know, tens of thousands of liters of water running through this room. You've got LED lights generating heat and humidity with that water. And then in the middle of the winter, you've got big cinder block walls that basically it's, you know, minus 15 outside. They turn into giant condensers. So you've got water pouring off the walls. It's just things that, again, you know, we didn't think about. So um, in the winter, there's just water everywhere. And then that just creates more humid. It was just a, it was a mess, to be honest. So again, good learnings. And that's how we learned, you know, to evolve our business and optimize. We use scissor lifts. You know, I'd say the stereotypical things that you used to see people joking about with vertical farms three and four or five years ago. That was us 10 years ago people up in scissor lifts, removing trays and water everywhere and dirt everywhere. That was, that was us. Yeah. (laughs) It it was bad. But a lot of, a lot of lessons from that, I'm sure. Well, yeah. And, you know, in retrospect, I think back and think where the industry is today, where the need is today, where our business is today and how many farms we have and the investment. And I think back to the investment that went into that little underperforming farm in Truro, Nova Scotia, you know, it was nothing. From an education standpoint, it was probably the best ROI we have we could have ever had. At the time, it felt like the sky was falling. But as you look back and say, you know, it was a couple million dollars of burned capital. But man, the learnings we had that we were able to roll forward in our business were just incredibly valuable. Right, right. I think most people that are listening to the show have heard the high level arguments for indoor agriculture and for vertical farming in terms of, you know, local, fresh water use, nutrient efficiency, all that good stuff. I wonder from an accounting and finance guy's perspective, what convinced you in your area of expertise that actually this wasn't just good for, you know, the food system. This is also good for, you know, as far as your your investors and your stakeholders. Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, when I went into this years ago, 
you know, everyone talks about the benefits, water usage, et cetera, et cetera. The economics have always been the, I'd say the sticking point in the business. So backtrack almost 10 years ago, I wasn't convinced the economics would get there. You know, it's capital intensive, you use energy, you need people, et cetera, et cetera. And you're competing against field grown product in California that, you know, the energy comes from the sun, it's free. So, you know, it's a difficult thing to compare. And we work a lot with the larger retailers and they're, you know, super secretive in terms of how the economics work and their business and competition, et cetera. But I've learned enough over the years that if I go back to when we first started selling back in 2014, there was a big difference. Like our selling price at Goodleaf landed into the retailers. It was more than double what the retailers were paying for field grown. And you can say sustainability and it's got a great story and it's local and all these, you know, it's food safe. All these things bring value, but ultimately, you know, there's a, there's a balance of cost versus benefit. So we're lucky. We, you know, we were able to sell at a price that was, you know, economical for us and our partners at the time were willing to pay for it. Um, more, I think, for all of those perceived benefits and and they actually priced it on shelf similar or actually at parity with California. So the end consumer wasn't seeing the difference. The retailers were seeing a margin compression. So that to me was always from the finance side. I was always worried about that because I just said like the gap's too big. You've got to bring your cost down. And my perspective, at least on the vertical farming business, and CEA in general, it's largely fixed cost driven. So it's really about, you know, if you produce whatever, 10 crates a day or 100 crates a day or 1,000 crates a day, there's not that big of a, of a cost difference. So it's about output and how effectively and how efficiently you can generate output. So my push was always, let's get the output up, which brings our, you know, our cost per unit down. But what I didn't anticipate to the extent that has happened is the upward pressure on the California field. Like it's just been almost the perfect storm for our industry, to be honest. Unfortunate for the end consumer, no doubt. But, you know, whether it's, call it extreme weather, California was in drought. Then this year, they're just soaked in water. So there's just massive supply shortages back in, I don't know, it was November, December, I think it was. We had the issues with uh, crop failures down there because of pests and, and things. And the price skyrocketed. The shipping costs, you know, I think everyone's talked about that for the last three or four years. It's gone through the roof. The Ukraine, Russia, you know, that doesn't directly impact our business here in North America, but it certainly does in overseas and in Europe. So these events that are happening, it's, I mean, it's scary for the world, but for our business, it's just driving that price of California field grown up. And what we're starting to see and what I'm hearing, we're not quite at parity, but it's getting pretty close. So we, you know, we haven't put through a price increase in, since 2014. And what we're just seeing is we're, we're stable and these guys just keep, keep pushing up. So we get our return. The issue is, are the retailers going to continue and the food service guys going to continue to, uh, to sell it if they're seeing compressed margins? But I think we're now starting to see close to parity and that margin issue is starting to resolve itself, which I'd like to say we looked in the crystal ball and predicted that 10 years ago. But we didn't. That was always what I was worried about. And we're just seeing these world events. It, it just seems like every year there's some new crazy thing that happens that's impacting the price of food. Yeah. Well, and, it, uh, you know, climate volatility has certainly always been part of the argument that uh, we'll be facing in the future. Now, I don't want to get too far down that road because if I uh, added 10 listeners, five would say that we're seeing climate volatility right now and it's climate change related. And the other five would say that's, you know, Ludicrous. So I, I don't need to get into that conversation, but certainly that's always been part of the argument as well. It's like, hey, we, we can have more control and not have to deal with climate volatility, which obviously with the floods and drought and everything you mentioned, we're seeing right now. You know, when I think vertical farming, I think leafy greens. And then I notice you have a partnership with McCain Foods, who I know as a potato company. So are you growing potatoes? What, what are you growing exactly? And, and, and maybe talk about that partnership. Yeah, no, fair enough. So there's a couple of things there I think worth touching on. We grow leafy greens right now. So spinach, arugula, spring mix, pea shoots, things like that. You know, that's always been our focus. And I, I think we've done a very good job with it. And that's why it's worked for us. We do not grow potatoes in a vertical farming environment, nor do I expect we ever will. But I do think there's a need to grow other crops. 
what those crops are is still a big question mark. You know, a lot of people are chasing strawberries. You know, we look at it and say there's other applications that we can do, things like producing crops potentially for extracts, for fragrances or cosmetics or nutraceuticals or, you know, whatever. But I do think there's more crops to be grown for human consumption in a vertical farm. And that's not to say, you know, I don't and we don't think vertical farming is the solution. We don't think it's the be all end all. We think it has a a role to play. And that's where I think, you know, there's always going to be field grown product. There's always going to be greenhouse product. I think now you're going to see vertical farm product or you are seeing it. And it's really the, you know, the integration of those three silos is going to be really interesting in the next few years. And I think that's where we ultimately go. I'll speak to the McCain partnership a little bit. So back in 2018, they invested in our business as an equity investor and as a strategic partner. McCain Foods is, is you know, they're a global company. I think they're in 100 and, over 160 countries. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many. I think they have facilities in over 50 countries, if I'm not mistaken. So they came into our business in 2018 as a, as a New Brunswick-based family agriculture company, I think is how they would identify. You know, they do potatoes. They do French fries. They've essentially, I believe, built their business with McDonald's selling French fries. And I, I think at one point I heard a stat, one in three or one in four French fries globally is a McCain French fry. So they're a big presence. And, you know, we're in Nova Scotia, they're in New Brunswick. And what they were looking for was, I think they call it the farm of the future. So how do we just create a more sustainable agricultural model? Not necessarily just for potatoes, but just in general. And we were at a bit of a crossroads. We as True Leaf and Good Leaf, because we actually had an investment proposal from a tech company that was a big ticket, no governance, and very easy money. And then we had a, a proposal from McCain Foods, which was very different. A little more governance, a little more oversight, lower valuation, et cetera. And that's where we really cemented ourselves as a food company. And we said, if we're going to be a food company, we need to commit to that. And we need a partnership with somebody like McCain's. So they came in in 2018 and they're a big organization, but they've always found time for us. And, you know, they've been extremely supportive. We can leverage their teams anywhere from sustainable energy to engineering to insurance support to commercialization support. If we have questions and we don't have internal resources, we can pick up the phone and and hopefully we can access somebody inside of McCain. So it's been a really, really good partnership in that way. They've continued to support us. And, you know, from their perspective, and I can't remember if this was an official comment or something we kind of joked about with the McCain guys, but, you know, you, you go to a steakhouse or you go to a, a pub or a restaurant and you order a, you know, a steak or a hamburger or whatever it is you order. And the question typically is, do you want fries or salad with that? McCain covers the fries and now we cover the salad. So that was kind of our, you know, the ad hoc sort of conversation, the joke we used to have with them is now they have both sides of the plate. So, you know, they don't own the business. They, they have a decent ownership at the stake in the business. They don't control it. They've just been a good strategic investor and, and partner for the last four or five years. That's really cool. Could, could you share more about this food company versus tech company? Uh, because, you know, I, I think maybe the intuitive part or the path most people would take is saying we are a tech company. That's what VCs want, right? They want technology. Maybe talk about the significance of that decision. And uh, if there were any concerns like, hey, maybe we do want to position ourselves as more of a tech company than food company and how you ultimately resolve that. Yeah, I mean, it was a big debate. I mean, we always identified that way sort of through the early years as a food company, I should say. And we always said tech is an enabler to us being a good food company. We're not a tech company that uses food. We're a food company that uses tech. And it's one thing to say it. Some of our tech in our farms, some of it's off the shelf. Some of it's completely custom. Some of it's modified off the shelf. But there's not anything extremely proprietary inside the farms. Uh, you know, we tried to base the model off relatively typical warehouse uh, sort of material handling. And where the rubber hit the road was that McCain sort of story I just told you with um, McCain Foods and we had a tech company, two different term sheets, we're bringing in capital. And the tech money was easy. It was easier money. It was much higher valuation. But we said, if we're going to be a food company, we need to commit to being a food company. And, you know, Food companies aren't going to get valuations like tech companies. It's just not the way it works. 
it's a different model. There's different expectations. There's different rigor. And at the time, in 2018, there was a handful of vertical farming companies in North America, certainly nothing like there is today, although there's certainly less today than there was last year. You know, we, we would have been the anomaly saying we're a food company back then. And we did it. I don't think it was to intentionally be different, but we wanted to chart our own path. And we felt strongly that people don't care about tech. When you go in to buy lettuce or you're going to buy lettuce to make salad for your family, you don't really care what technology is behind it. You pick up the clamshell, you give it a shake, you look to see if it's slimy, you look to see if it's clean and it's good. And then you take it home and taste it. And if it's good, then you're going to buy it. So for us, it was just a customer proposition of you got to have good food for people to buy it. So that was kind of our belief in the early days. And, you know, we really had to look inside of ourselves on those term sheets to say, who are we? And we stuck with the food model. And you're, I think you're seeing more of the players, the bigger players now are kind of positioning themselves less on tech, more on food. And, you know, I'm pretty active in the investment space, the VC and private equity space. And I would say a few of the bigger vertical farm players had crazy valuations a couple of years ago because they were playing the tech card and, you know, they, they were getting valuations that were just, I don't know, I think unsupportable in my opinion, but um, we chose a different path. And I think that's inherent in tech companies. And the tech company model, I believe, from an investment perspective is, you know, it's a, it's a home run swing. You hit one and you're going to make a killing, but you're going to miss more than you're going to hit. But you, the ones you hit are big home runs. You know, we've tried to play the more traditional, say, CPG model of let's just kind of build it slow, lower value, a little more capital efficient. And it's kind of worked for us. And I, I think, you know, there's a, been a bunch of failures in the industry in the last well couple months, really. And I think largely the capital markets have dried up. But I think that's the tech mentality of don't worry about profit. Don't worry about cash flow. You're going to just raise more money and just keep the wheel turning. But then when the money stops coming, you know, you don't have any profit. You're not sustainable. So we've kind of played that food play all along of get to profitability, get to financial sustainability. And, um, you know, eventually if the capital dries up, we're able to sustain. So it, I think it's played well for us, but it's, it wasn't easy. I mean, there was tough decisions made over the years and a lot of debate and, you know, McCain was really what solidified that path for us, I would say. Yeah, no, that's, it seems like such a smart partnership on both sides and, and one that really sets you up to create a lasting business rather than a flash in the pan. This is a really interesting kind of conversation right here about, about which companies seem to be making it versus which, you know, seem to be falling off. And, and as you've mentioned, there have been some that have fallen off. Yeah, I'm making an assumption here and I want you to redirect me if I'm wrong. I would assume it's not the technology that has been the problem necessarily with the companies that are falling off. Uh, it's maybe an over-reliance on that investment as fuel to to keep going. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think they're all they're all unique. This is my perspective, and I don't know any of this to be 100% certain, but I, I think I'm pretty dialed into the industry. You know, there's the whole tech analogy, which, you know, we've kind of talked about where Capital has been readily available. I think there's been like three billion dollars has flowed into CEA or sustainable agriculture in the last couple of years. If you needed money, you just raise money. That really changed, you know, really when COVID hit and people started to be a little more, you know, risk averse or a little more cognizant of where the capital is going. But ultimately, and again, I'm I'm stereotyping or lumping a bunch of these together, but there's definitely some of them have been so focused on technology. So You've got a farm, you build technology that can grow spinach well. And instead of just saying, okay, I can grow spinach well, well, now let's make it economical and sell it. They try to improve the technology and they iterate and they iterate and they iterate and iterating costs money. And, you know, I know, I know for certain, at least one, the investors just became sort of disenfranchised with the lack of commercialization and the focus on technology and patents. They're saying, just go sell go sell lettuce. That's what you're here to do. Don't worry about, you know, farm 5.0 or whatever you're calling it. Just go, go sell. So, you know, we haven't done that. And it's probably cost us at times. I'm not saying we have the perfect model, but I think some of the guys that are failing or the companies that are failing, it's largely they've been too focused on tech. The other one too, which I think is understated and I don't think it's enough airtime is food safety. 
we were growing in an old school. It was a disaster, as I mentioned. And, you know, we quickly realized, whoa, food safety is a big deal. And quite frankly, Loblaw at the time was very supportive and they kept whacking us on the knuckles saying, guys, clean up your food safety. Like we need this and this and this and this. Otherwise, we're not going to buy it. So we were really early adopters on the food safety side. And then there's a bunch of food safety issues and recalls coming out of California, Romaine. And it just happened like it seemed like every couple months for the better part of two years. So we were well positioned because we had this sort of food safety positive release model, a very robust program, and some of the others didn't. And it's a difficult thing to go back in and implement after the fact. So I think some of them have probably struggled with, you know, some food safety issues, some recalls. I know one for sure. Um, so I think you got a mixed bag. I think some of it was poor design. Some of it was too much tech focus and iterating. And then the coffers ran dry. Capital stopped flowing. and. You know, people have big overheads that are burning. Some of these guys are burning tens of millions of dollars a year in cash. So that's a pretty tough business to keep sustaining, especially when the markets dry up. And that's one thing I noticed is on one hand, you have sort of the skeptics as companies have have gone under the skeptics saying, see, I told you the energy costs are too high. The labor costs are too high. There's no differentiation. This could never work. And then you look at the companies that have gone under and, and some of them, I don't know all of them. Some of them were pouring all that money into growth, not into actually lowering the costs. And so the money they were burning was not all. I mean, certainly energy and labor are, are expensive, but the money seemed to be in how can we race to the next facility? Is that an accurate characterization? Yeah, absolutely. And again, like I'm, I'm probably overly, you know, I'm critical of ourselves a bit on this. We wanted to go fast. We wanted to build new farms in, you know, every city imaginable, more or less. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not entirely. And what we saw there was a race. Like I call it a flag planting exercise. I'm building in Atlanta and I'm building in Portland and I'm building in, you know, Austin and boom, boom, boom. And they're running around buying land and starting these new projects. And I don't think they had, again, I, I don't want to sound too critical because we're certainly not perfect either, but you know, they didn't have the foundational elements right. They didn't actually have unit economics that could support these firms yet. And I think they did it with the assumption that they'll figure it out. And you know, I just think they didn't figure it out and the well ran dry. We had a very aggressive growth mandate. And you know, we we had that debate and I, for one, was pushing to go faster um, with that sort of entrepreneurial spirit. And then some of our bigger institutional investors are saying, guys, slow, get it right. The analogy or the comments or the phrase we use is go slow to go fast. So get it right. And then once you've got it right, then we'll hit the gas. So we've got a facility in Guelph, Ontario that had been problematic. We've resolved it. It now functions very, very well. And then we've got two projects underway in Montreal and Calgary, uh, one each. and that's a lot. That's, that's a big bite. We don't have a big overhead. We don't have a big staff. So we're focused on let's do these well. Let's get them stood up and producing good product. And then we'll go build some more. So I joke, which is perhaps inappropriate at times, but it's the Canadian approach. We're conservative. We're a little more risk averse. We're a little more capital efficient. We just do things a little differently here. And some of our American counterparts are raising tons of money and going fast. And I think it's kind of come back to bite a few of them. Yeah, it seems like a lot more coming around to that Canadian perspective, I think. You mentioned kind of unit economics. Is there a way for you to create differentiation in your unit economics? I mean, is it you know, where you can lower your energy costs and your labor costs? Or is it just more just like you said earlier about output? Like, hey, those are fixed. We're just going to have the output soar. I think it's both. Like, I, you know, there's definitely output, but there's also a cap. Like, there's only so much weight you can get out of a square foot of, of growth space. I mean, eventually the product deteriorates. It gets too wet. It gets too thick. It gets too big, whatever. You know, nobody wants to eat a kale leaf that's the size of your, your head. So, you know, there's a balance on the output, but there is optimization for sure. And I think in terms of cost, there's absolutely, you know, largely energy is energy. But there's certainly regions where it's less expensive than others. There's regions where government provides rebates to bring down that energy costs. So in Quebec, as an example, we pay a fraction of what we would pay in Ontario. You know, labor is tricky and always has been tricky in this space. And it's not unique to vertical farming these days. It's just labor is expensive and difficult to find. 
So you can solve for some of that with automation. We call it smart automation. So you don't automate everything. You do it where the ROI makes sense. So we're largely automated, but we still have quite a few staff in a facility. But it's the CapEx is another one. And it's, you know, trying to bring down your capital costs so that, you know, you can get a an ROI that, you know, achieves your kind of hurdle rate and can bring your price of your product down a little bit. I mean, lettuce is a commodity. You call it what you like. You can brand it. You can call it local. You can call it clean. You can call it organic, whatever you want to call it. It's very much commoditized at this point. So there will be a race on price at some point. And that's really what our focus is now is how do we bring our cost structure down so that we can compete on price when the time comes? And I, I think we've done a good job. Like we haven't had to put through a price increase in, I don't know, what's that, seven years or something. So we've done a good job of bringing the price down, the cost down, I should say. But I think we need to do better. And that's, to me, the people that are going to win in this space, and there'll be more than one, are going to be those that figured out how do you get the most weight output with the lowest cost structure, which obviously kind of goes without saying, but um, that's really what we're focused on. How do you bring down those costs that you can control to some extent? Yeah. Well, you have talked about how True Leaf and Gold Leaf are two different names. Can you maybe define those two, why the two different names? Yeah, so, so True Leaf was the first company and that's the parent company. The concept originally was, you know, back to the technology food discussion, was, you know, what if Trueleaf is a technology company and builds and creates technology and then Goodleaf as a wholly owned subsidiary, that's our operating brand now. That's what people know us. That is a food company. We created it with the idea or the concept or the flexibility that Goodleaf can own and operate farms, sell produce into the major retailers, food service companies across Canada and maybe the US. Trueleaf would maybe build farms or sell technology to people who wanted to build farms in regions that we don't compete through Goodleaf. So maybe overseas or in Asia or Australia. So that was the original kind of founding premise. And, you know, we quickly decided we're not a tech company, so that model doesn't work. But we do think, and, you know, to this day, we still believe there's other opportunities outside of food production. So we've kind of kept the two companies, True Leaf being the owner of Good Leaf. Good Leaf's a food company, but you know, is there an opportunity to to spin up a business that does extracts or you know does something that we haven't even contemplated yet? Because we do think there's an evolution to happen, and there's a there's a tremendous amount of opportunity coming our way. We just don't know exactly what some of it is yet. So we wanted to create the flexibility that we can have subsidiaries that. Um, kind of each have their own unique proposition. Is there work being done on that? Like substantial work of people trying to look at how can we use vertical farm to grow something other than leafy green, you know, for extracts or for scents or for nutraceuticals? Is there substantial work being done in that area or is that still kind of something we're talking decades away? So I'd say it's in the middle. I would say there's not substantial work happening, but there's work happening. Like, I don't think we're decades away. I would say we are, we're more than sniffing around there. We're, you know, we're starting to invest a little bit. We're exploring it. It's still pretty high level. We're still pretty focused on the food business at this point. So there's not a lot of resources to kind of allocate to that. But I wouldn't say it's decades. I'd say it's sometime in the next 10 years, something's going to materialize. And I don't know if it's fragrances or it's extracts or it's nutraceuticals or cosmetics, who knows. But um, I, I do believe there's an application there that's, that's going to be economically viable. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, on the surface with what little I know about it, it, it seems to make a lot of sense. You, you're really concentrating on some high value stuff that I'm sure, you know, is, is nuanced and growing, which I would think vertical farming would be uniquely yeah, suited I mean, for. It, I mean, it's, it's always been there from my perspective. Some of our first investors actually were from the pharmaceutical industry. And this goes back to 2013 ish. The whole concept was even in the pharmaceutical space, synthetics are so expensive and there's, you know, a bit of a negative connotation around them. And botanical pharmaceuticals are really starting to kind of move up the curve. And, you know, I'm not sure we'd want to chase pharmaceuticals just from a regulatory standpoint. But even that, the fact they invested in the business for that reason kind of showed that, geez, you know what, there is an application here. The botanical market, the world is going in that direction. Um, not just for you know food, but for other things. So I think it's just a matter of keeping a pulse on what's happening in the broader industry and figuring out how 
our technology, our business model, our application can jump in and, and support one of those or a couple of those initiatives. Well, one of one of the the points I've heard made about vertical farming um, has been it better positions us to to reduce one of the biggest culprits in the food system, which is waste, uh, both on uh, food waste and on, you know, plastic uh, waste, you know, clamshells. And I realize, you know, right now you're probably tackling other challenges, but is is that something that that you all are focused on as well? And um, have you found anything that really has has worked so far? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I think from a food waste perspective, no question, it makes a difference. It, this is a stat and it's an old one and it came directly, I think, from Loblaw at the time. And granted, it was Newfoundland. So do you think Newfoundland is the end of the food chain relative to California of built ground produce? But when we started selling out of Nova Scotia into Newfoundland, the category shrink, I think, was reduced from 40% to 4% or something. That's an old number. And I don't think that was ever necessarily vetted, but it was given to me as a, a data point at one point. So I think it speaks to the power of food waste. And, you know, you look at the shelf life on a product is, I think they generally stamp at 14 days. You know, ours, we stamp, I think we're 17 days now, but like our product lasts 28 days, no problem. And it's grown in market. So we're on shelf within a couple of days versus, you know, a week from California. So I think there's absolutely a food waste consideration here. The plastic clamshell, that's still the bane of my existence. Like, there's better ways. There's more sustainable ways to do that. We've seen them. We've trialed them. We, we, you know, we have some in, in the chute, so to speak. You go to Europe, it's all thin filmed uh, bags. And the issue here, I believe, and I, I don't want to throw any partners under the bus here, but you know, the retailers have these spring-loaded five decks, they call them, where these clamshells sit in there and they're pressurized. So as soon as you pull one out, they all shoot forward. And like, there's a tremendous amount of pressure. If you ever tried to push a clamshell back into one of those, you realize how much pressure. So there's very specific requirements on density of plastic and shape of clamshell to make those work. So to me, there's a broader industry conversation here to say, let's come up with a better way. The better way exists. We just need buy-in across you know, consumers as well. Consumers like to pick up the clamshell and look at the bottom and shake it and kind of look 360 at the product. So you need consumers to say, I'm okay with only a little window to see the product. There's an adoption exercise, I think, that has to happen all the way from the consumer through the retailer and into the producer. But I'd love to see that change. I think it's ready. We just, we haven't adopted yet. And on the, on the food waste side, when, when, and I know you gave some caveats to these stats, but let's just go with them for a second. You know, if it drops from 40% to 4%, does the grocer capture that value or kind of who captures that value? Yeah, it's kind of the million dollar question that nobody wants to share. Um, you know, the end consumer absolutely captures some of that value. No question. And I'm only speaking from a personal perspective right now. That's where the biggest value capture is. But there's no question it impacts, it, it helps the retailers, right? They've got a big shrink waste category that, that they're writing off or they're putting the red stickers on at 50% markdown or whatever the case may be. So it's going to reduce their shrink. You know, I would say they would argue reducing their shrink and extending shelf life for end consumers ultimately means the Tim and the Jeffs of the world are buying less packages because the packages last longer. So, you know, I, I absolutely huge impact to the end consumer. I've experienced it personally, but, I, you know, I still believe there's a big impact on the retailer there as well. There's got to be. Yeah, what you think? All right. Well, I know we're running out of time here, but I do want to ask you about the state of fundraising today. You know, we're in this environment in 2023 where uh, venture capital is not what it was two years ago, um, at least in terms of readily available uh, for a lot of ag tech. Interest rates are high, at least here, I assume, in Canada as well. What is the kind of the state of fundraising and, and what message would you have for other entrepreneurs out there who might be listening to this? Yeah, it's tough. It's a grind. I've been at this for, I don't know, 20 some odd years in sort of the finance world. I don't know if this is the worst I've seen it, but it's pretty close for early stage companies. Everyone's looking for companies that are generating profit and are financially sustainable. You know, I think that goes to the conversation you and I had earlier, Tim, around a lot of these kind of tech companies just are burning big capital and the capital tap turned off and they couldn't sustain. So, you know, I know Warren Buffett came out and said, hey, I'm only investing in companies that are profitable. 
the risk profile has shifted you know, debt's expensive. You know, it's the most expensive I've seen it in probably what 10 years, 15 years, probably. So it's a tough, tough time to be raising money. The one thing I would say though, and, and I'm pretty active in the markets, um, the private markets, there's a tremendous amount of capital out there, but it's a little more astute. It's a little more risk averse and it's a little more discerning in terms of where they're going to place their bets. And, you know, specific to controlled environment agriculture and sustainable agriculture, there's big institutions out there with big, big checks waiting to bet on the right horse and the people that show they can do it and do it economically, sustainably or viably. So I think I wouldn't say there's less money out there, but there's a lot more sitting on the sidelines and the the days of the Wild West of you know, spray and pray, writing checks and writing checks and hoping they hit, those are over for now. For those entrepreneurs, for those early stage companies looking to raise capital, it's about, you know, get your economics tight, show at least a path to profitability in the very near term. The days of big overhead spending and all that are behind us for now. And be very concise in your in your your story. And if the story's there and the economics are there, the money's there. The days of the easy capital raise are those are long gone. And so, so you've been in this industry now for coming up on ten years. And uh, I guess I wonder, ten years from now, what do you think will surprise the average person most about uh, controlled environment ag? That's a good question. Um, you know what? I think it's going to be. I mean, cons- end consumers don't care about unit economics; they just care the price they pay on the shelf. And I'm biased, which kind of goes without saying. But I think in 10 years, you're going to be surprised by how many products on the shelf are coming out of controlled environment agriculture, whether it's vertical farm or greenhouse. You know, there's a shift happening that, you know, I I feel like nobody talks about it, where, you know, a lot of field farmers in California, everywhere, Nova Scotia is no different. They're shifting their products to more high value crops, grapes for wine industry, if they can, the cheap lettuce model is it's not that appealing so that's where i feel like there's going to be this level set and it's going to take years and years decades probably where you know the the agriculture space is going to flush out and we're going to say hey this crop or these crops make sense to be field grown these crops make sense to be vertically firm these crops make sense to be greenhouse so like that all has to still flush out everyone's kind of in each other's sandbox still but I think what you're going to find in the next 10 years, you're going to walk into the produce section and virtually everything is going to be locally grown and it's going to come from controlled environment agriculture in one form or the other. You know, I think that's a big win. You know, I go to buy basil now, it's out of Peru, or I go to buy cherries, they're from Mexico, or I'm buying, you know, there's not very few, very few local options. And in order for that stuff to travel, the genetics of that, that product are and this, the stuff they have to spray on it, it just, it'd be nice if you could just go and buy something that was grown and sort of the, the equivalent of a, a neighbor's garden. You can buy that off the shelf. And I do think in 10 years, that's what consumers are going to want. And I think that's what the supply chain is going to dictate. So um, that's, that's my belief. Again, I'm obviously biased, but I don't think we have a choice. All right. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you so much to Jeff McKinnon. I hope all of you listening found that as interesting and insightful as I did on on multiple fronts. Really some good stuff there. Thank you very much again to Jeff McKinnon for being on the show. Go check them out either at trueleaf.ca. There's uh, there's no E in the true there. So T-R-U-L-E-A-F dot C-A or at goodleaffarms.com. Thank you again to Calgary Economic Development for being our sponsor here this quarter and really for making the connection to Jeff to have him here on the show. I thought that added a ton of value. And last but certainly not least, thank you for your time and your attention. I don't take it lightly. I'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation.